Hello, everyone. I am here with Jeannie Dietrich, who is the founder and CEO of Armit Dietrich, a Chicago-based integrated marketing communications firm. She's also the lead blogger at the PR and marketing blog Spin Sucks, is co-author of Marketing in the Round, and is also co-host of Inside PR, a weekly podcast about communications and social media. And today, we are going to talk about objectivism <laughs> in journalism <laughs> and how social media, page views, and Google are affecting it. First off, Jeannie, can you please help me pronounce objectivism? <laughs> objectivism. You, you did it right. Objectivism. I, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. It's a hard word, and I think well. I have a bit of a speech impediment, but I think everyone knows. We're going to be talking about being objective in journalism. How about that? There you go. There you go. That's there you perfect. go. There you go, perfectly. All right, so this is obviously a huge thing these days. Uh, you know, you have lots of people, lots of new sites, uh, I mean, lots of new news sites, kind of quotes with the news, who have popped up over the years and supposedly have given newsworthy, but it's really been about click, you know, all the way to possibly clickbait. Uh, um, at the very least, I think all of us can agree that a lot of very surface level type of information is being given out. If it's true or not, I don't think they even care about. And then you have, you know, the, how this has affected other types of, you know, very newsworthy sites like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, all of them because, you know, they're getting clicks taken away and that's where they get paid. So right. that's, this is a big deal and that's why you have the ad blockers coming up and you have all this stuff that's centered around all this and I think it really boils down to this. So first off, please give me your take on where we are currently with journalism in regards to being objective versus, I guess, sensationalism, which is the counter of that. So I'll give you a personal experience. Um, during the Republican, Republican National Committee um, soiree, right after Donald Trump gave his speech, you know, to accept the nomination, I was uh, looking through the, the front page of the New York Times the next morning. And the two stories on the New York Times front page, front cover, Above the fold were about how, um, and I can't remember the, the headline, but essentially the first one, you know, that kind of ran the, the width of the newspaper was he gave his speech, he's an idiot, I can't believe that um, we're letting this person accept the nomination. Oh, the really? second one, right? Yeah. The second one that ran the vertical of the front page was about how he had this opportunity to get up in front of, in front of millions of people on a global stage and talk about, you know, his childhood and where he came from and the things that he's learned and start to talk about his policies. And he didn't take advantage of that. Instead, he chose to um, you know, talk poorly about his opponent and all those other things. Mm -hmm. And even though I tend to agree that he does, should not be our next president, I no, looked I at you. that and I, I looked at that and I thought, this is incredible because it was completely full of opinion. It was completely full of, well, I guess, what you would call uh, clickbait, even though it was the actual newspaper. And it was, even though it was somewhat based in facts, it was based in fact from the perspective of I'm going to use these facts to, my, to support my opinion. And mm -hmm. you're supposed to have, I mean, the New York Times, even though they've always said it's a liberal bending and blah, 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 it still has always had sort of that journalistic integrity. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and I thought, this is where we are. This is the world that we're in. Because mm -hmm. no longer is it about journalistic integrity. It's all about sensationalism. And you know who mm -hmm. changed that was Michael Arrington at TechCrunch. He said, he said, he's famous for saying, it doesn't matter if we get it right as long as we get it first. We can always change it later. Yeah, yeah, I saw that when I was doing research on this, I, and I couldn't believe it. That was that was as early yeah. as 2014, I think it said that he said that. That's only two years right. ago. You right. know, <laughs> that's that's awful. I know, and right. you know what? I mean, do we blame the New York Times, or do we just kind of pity them the fact that man, they're mixed up in all of this? You know, you have your Buzzfeeds of the world who are. You know, and then, you know, New York Times needs to be able to pay journalists. I mean, that yeah, I just, I feel so stuck, you know, and I feel, and I'm not even, you know, in that world. And I, I only can imagine 
where where they are. So I mean, basically, you're saying it's gotten to the top. You know, the the disease has gotten all the way to the to the, the disease top has the food gotten to chain. the top. Yep, it totally has. I mean, so I know you mentioned uh, that you know uh, what was his name from Gawker or previously from Gawker, I guess. Um, Michael Aronson. Yeah. So you mentioned how that's you know what, how he stated it, but what do you think led to this problem? I mean, is it you know? I mean, I guess you just answered that. What do you think led to all this? Well, I think it's a couple of things. I think it's our it's our um, need for. Um, what should I call it? Uh, you know, I mean, we all like a good train wreck, right? Like the the whole you you always stop for a train wreck, always, 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 always. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it goes everything from seeing an accident on the freeway to mm-hmm. you know wanting to see whatever is going on um, online. And so when you have what I'll call quote unquote journalism um, working toward that and trying to appease that, it, it, that's. I mean, that's, I think, that's where, it, where it stems yeah. from. Yeah, it's, it's part of the emotion of the human being. And, and our attention deficit it keeps, I mean, our attention keeps getting, what, lower and lower and lower and lower. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think, what do they say, eight seconds, you know? You have before right, you start right. Thinking about, I mean, and, and that's just social media. So, I mean, that's just, again, we're just, you know, stating, like, we're we're basically just describing the world that we live in right now, which is, I mean, as you know, obviously, we're, as we get going, we're going to talk about hopefully some potential solutions. Hopefully, it's not pie in the sky stuff, I and mean, we'll get to all that. But you know, it, it's just the world that we're currently living in. You know, and um, that's that's basically it. You know, the the quick the quick hits. The I think Buzzfeed's probably a pretty big. You know, probably part of this. You know, and um, taking money away from these other sites, and you know the you know the decline of the newspaper print, you know, and stuff like that, I guess. But uh, who, 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 who or what do you think are, are the biggest culprits in all of this? I think it is, you know, it's BuzzFeed, it's TechCrunch, it's, um, I mean, the Huffington Post has some matters, it's um, Vox, you know, I would say is guilty of it. Um, Upworthy, you know, even though they post good stuff, it's it's very clickbaity, you know. So I think there's lots of organizations that are guilty of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And are now on the flip side, and unfortunately, you know, you you led with an example of the highest on the food chain, basically, or one of the highest. But who who are the ones? And maybe maybe you can still, you know, you know, give props to the New York Times and you know some of these others. But who are the ones still trying to do it the right way, in your opinion? So hard. Um. Yeah, I think I can name like, one. I can name one for you. I, uh, Texas Tribune here in, in Austin, Texas. You know, do they, they still? Uh, they they uh, yeah, and I, I know they really really do a very good job of biting their tongues and stuff and, and doing it the right way because they're they it's a political site and they have to toe the line between Republicans and Democrats. You know, so they, sure. they, yeah. they, 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 I guess, I guess they're, that's one of those things where the forces of nature force them to be that way because if not, their whole business model breaks down, you know, because right. it's about both. So they're almost forced to do it. So that, that's one, but it's kind of a somewhat local, I mean, they're national ish esque just because they're, they're pretty, pretty big. But do you know of anyone else, you know, on a national scale that might be trying to do it the right way? You know, I mean, I think you have to almost go international. You've got Guardian who seems to be, um, a little more uh, fair and balanced. Um, BBC, of course, does. I was sad to see Al Jazeera go away because they were doing a really nice job of, of fair and balanced. Um, the Wall Street Journal, I think, still does to some extent. But, I mean, mm-hmm. the New York Times, which was sort of sort of always been my favorite, and, if, I mean, just because I already said that I don't believe Voldemort should be our next president, you probably know which yeah. way I vote. But, yeah. Um, I, so and that I might am, be part I of the reason they did liberal, that, but, though. <laughs> you know, he's but so think, you know, bad, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but at the same time, you and maybe they know their audience bit better than I do, and maybe their audience is, you know, 95% of people who wouldn't vote for him, and maybe that's why they did it. But it still seems like when you have a national media outlet that is supposed to be here for fair and unbalanced, information and for us to get actual news without bias Mm -hmm. and you have one of what's supposed to be one of the best in the country 
it's and they're not doing it is kind of hard to it's a hard pill to swallow I think. Yeah, well, a couple of other ones doing it the right way are MSNBC and Fox News. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> No, neither one of those are biased at all. <laughs> the best, to, you know how you know what you can do though, is you can watch both, and if you watch both, you, can. you, you, you can, might you, you might get some getting, truth. <laughs> I I still think you're not getting. I don't. I still don't think you're getting the truth. I really don't. No, I agree. I agree. I've always said that that's the only way I can even try to get a handle on what's going on is I have to watch both. You know, and I guess I lean left. Um, but overall, I really that. lean middle. I want I want a middle party. That's really what I want. But I That's mean, what, what I, I do. Too. Yeah. But I, I'll watch Fox News because it's I I don't want to just hear you know people massaging my opinion. You know I want to hear. But the you're other not side. the norm. You're not the norm. I'm not the norm. We're both educated human beings, and they just did a study over the weekend that said that the number one person who's voting for that has said they're going to vote for Donald Trump is. Um, an uneducated, like eighth grade educated white male. Yeah, right. I just saw that too. So you know. they're not the they're not going to do that kind of research. They like yeah. to have their their opinions massaged. And yeah, I totally think that way, and that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Like that's the. I was right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful. It's awful. So. um I think we've identified there's a problem, and I, you know, and there's I don't know if we're like, you know, we're <laughs> like, oh, we're geniuses here. I think, you know, if you start talking about this in the least, you'll be like, oh, you're right. Yeah, this, this is this is insane. This is awful. If you just go with the stream, you might not realize it, but if you take a half step back, you'll see it. But to, to, you know, to kind of see like like Facebook's role in all of this, and like the filter bubble, and can you educate people what the filter bubble is and uh, what it means to all of us? So, um, yes, and I think it goes to exactly what you were just saying, where you have, you tend to have, you, well, first of all, you read or watch the news that you agree with, right? And I think that goes to, for anything. You read bloggers that you agree with, you read books that you, that, you know, tend to support your thinking, all those kinds of things. So it's not just news media. So we, we live in this bubble that we've created for ourselves that we've filtered out the stuff that we don't agree with. Um, and then, of course, it, it's sort of been proven it lately that this may not be the case, but it looks to be that Facebook particularly, they're, they have human being aggregators of content, and it looked to be that they tended to be more liberal leaning. And so the information that was on Facebook, you know, trending stories and things like that tended to be more liberal leaning. Um, I still think that that's probably the case. I do think, you know, just based on what I've been watching and, and reading and but from both sides of the, the party line that, Facebook team that seems to be taking that very seriously and trying to provide a more fair, fair and balanced. But trending stories by itself, you know, you're you're probably going to see some, something different than I see just because of you know friends and who you, who you let into your stream and who you've unfollowed but remain friends with and all those kinds of things. So you've created this bubble around yourself with with news and friends and family and blogs and everything um, that supports the way that you think. So, so basically, the yeah, the filter it's basically like an algorithm that that right. Facebook will will put in front of your you know on your feed what they think that you want to see. Is that basically it in a nutshell? Right. It, which which would be basically like only allowing a right wing person to watch Fox News information, and on the left wing only having MSNBC stuff get in front of them. Basically, no right. matter. Right. And that, that, so you're just going to keep purveying that over and over. And if you're saying they lean left, well, then the, will they force the left-wing stuff in front of somebody who has shown to lean right as far as political stuff goes? Not necessarily, but I think they will. They are trying to to balance it out more. You know, I mean, like mm -hmm. it's this thing with with Kim Kardashian. Why the heck do I have to keep seeing Kim Kardashian in my stream? I don't care, um, but apparently my friends do. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's that kind of stuff where you may continue to see it. I mean, if you just look at Facebook trending stories right this second, let's we'll see what it is. I'm sure there's <laughs> okay. some Olympic stuff, but let's look and see. Yeah, I have uh, to have a little Usain Bolt on there. Well, there's no, there's Miley Cyrus and Liam Hemsworth. Oh, there's come on. Kevin Hart got married. Um, oh, there was an unidentified woman's body found near a jogging path in right by my house. That's awesome. Oh, um, well, there's Karen, Kendall Jenner, so there's the Kardashian. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) Gabby Douglas is far down, but it's not about the actual Olympics. It's about it's about her feelings were hurt over criticism. Um, and that is the that is the only thing in Facebook trending stories right now about the Olympics. That's the and only did you thing. just see everything you just you just mentioned? I mean, all of that should have been on you know in one of those U.S. weeklies or whatever the trashy ones are. You know, right? I mean, right. I don't I don't know if U.S. Weekly is a trashy one. I can't remember, but those other ones. You know, that's I mean every single one of those things. You know, I mean every single yep. one. So we yep. there is yep. a problem. There's a problem in you know getting to you know and I guess. You know, native ads, clickbait, you know, native ads have been abused and the like. Um, is there anything happening that might help control all of this? No, because I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is people love the trash. I mean, that's just human beings. I don't think we can stop that. Yeah, I hear you. I, I think we all, okay, I think I think we're on agreement, you know, or me and you in agreement, and I think most everybody would be hard to disagree that that this is actually happening. There's too much data out there showing that it is. So I think we all can agree that the integrity of news sites and news in general has taken a hit over the years. But there's also been lots of problems that have been brought a light shown on them, which is a good thing, you know, bases like the good old boy network, you know, holding everything in or Big Brother, you know, that kind of mindset. So so what's your, your overall take? Does the, does the good that has come out of the growth of web and, you know, shining light on some of this stuff um, – outshine the bad that has come with it or or vice versa? I mean, I think I know your answer based on hearing your frustration on it all. But, you know, I mean, you know, we used to be dictated what, what we people wanted to feed us. So there is some good sure. that's come of it. But There's, so yeah, what, what's, yeah. your, what's, your, what's your take on that? Overall, I mean, you're, would you rather have it the other way or do you like it now or what, what, what are you, what, where is your head out there? Um, did you happen to watch the O.J. Simpson special on ESPN, the five-part or eight-part documentary? I have watched about 30 hours of O.J. Simpson stuff. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I watched. I watched the entire one with the Kardashians and you know the the one with David Schwimmer and all that. And then I did watch all the 30 for 30. They were fantastic. But yes. Uh, I did. Yeah. So what I thought was interesting about that whole thing is. They, you know, they sort of wove in the uh, LA or the LA riots and Rodney King and sort of all of that horrible racist stuff that was happening back then. And mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting how they talked about, you know, O.J. Simpson didn't want to participate in that as a leader of the African American community because mm-hmm. he simply just didn't want to be seen as an African American. And O.J. Right, he's O.J. Simpson, right? Mm-hmm. So. But I, what I found interesting about that and how, you know, that whole side story of things is nothing's changed. Black men are still being killed by cops. And I think what's happening right now is because of exactly what you said, that we have access and there's a bigger megaphone and people can, you know, Facebook live stream being pulled over or whatever it happens to be, you know, people live streaming, getting shot. Um, It's now making it a priority to get fixed. And what Mm -hmm. was that 40 years ago? So all of this has been going on underneath our noses for 40 years and it's Mm -hmm. never been brought to light until now. And I think it's because of, social media and the megaphone and being able to do all those things. And I hope that it does fix it because Mm -hmm. it's been 40 years. That's unreal. It's Mm -hmm. unreal. Yeah. No, I was going to do the same thing and I was watching it. I was like, this, this is unreal. I mean, and and it really, it it almost changed my mind a little bit. I was always just irritated that OJ Simpson, the man, just that person in particular got off. Cause I think it was, I think it's hard to argue that, he didn't do it, but after right. watching that, I, I kind of changed my mind on if for the greater. Now I really see where um, the defense was coming from. It wasn't about yeah. him, yeah. Right. and I, I never ever, even in watching all the other, you know, all the other, you know, eighteen hours plus that twelve or whatever. I still, and, and but finally watching that one, I was like, you know what? And especially the fact that he ended up getting in jail anyways, the the person, the, right. that particular O.J. Simpson <laughs> person, it made it a lot easier to have my opinion. Because if he was still walking around and, you know, and pictures of him in hot tubs with all these girls and all that stuff playing golf, 
you know, it's hard to stomach, you know. But, right. you know, the fact that that happened, it, you know, it really solidified. I was like, you know what? You know, I feel bad for that wrong, you know, the family, the, the other family that had to deal with it. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, I think overall it might have been – I think it worked out the way it needed to work out because it, it brought a lot of um, – it brought a lot of light on, on, on those issues, and it's hard to argue that they're not issues. Um, you have to be really close-minded to, to to not, you know, open your eyes and just see what's going on in the world. So, but, so that's the good that's come out of, you know, you know the, the sensationalism stuff, you know. I mean, it's brought – it's shown a light on problems. So that's, that, that, that is a huge check mark in the favor, right? I think so, too. Yeah, I think so, too. The bad check mark is what can you believe anymore? Right. And right. you know, are are people getting their second and third sources or whatever they need to that journalists have, you know, as far as what they're supposed to be doing to be, you know, hold their integrity and then not not you know, and I'm sure they're getting pressures for clicks and money and all that and that's a big problem and part of this could be an an economical problem, you know, could be Economy is probably sure. a part yep. in all of for this. For sure, yeah, because you know? you've got to – you're right. You said this earlier, but they have to be able to pay their journalists. And, you know, if yeah. you're not making any money – and, I mean, the podcast that you recorded earlier about ad blocking and people are blocking all that. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's still the wild, wild west that we live in. What I think is interesting about this is – do you remember, happen to remember when Natasha Richardson died and she it was – She'd had an accident on the ski slope and had bumped her head, and Who? it killed her. Natasha Rich- Richardson, she was um, uh, Liam Neeson's wife. Okay. Um, it was interesting because this had to have been – well, we can look it up, but it was several, several years ago. And it was – I first saw it on Twitter that she had – that they were reporting that she had died from this fall, which seemed benign because she was – I think she was even on the bunny hill. So, like, she just slipped and happened to hit her head, and that's what killed her. Um, but they had reported it on Twitter, and TMZ kept saying, like, they, she's died, she's dead, she's dead, she's dead. And nobody believed TMZ. So you waited, like, I think it was two days before traditional media confirmed that she had died. And mm-hmm. so you just, back then, you know, you just sort of waited to see if the traditional media was going to confirm it. And now TMZ, which I don't know how we live in this world, but they're – Every time they report on something like that, they're right. They're right every time. And it's, it's a, I mean, you, you look at it and you go, how is it that the Wall Street Journal or CNN or MSNBC or the Fox News or whatever it happens to be can't get this right, but freaking TMZ can? That's funny. Now, and you know what? Who knows? Maybe that's going to be the solution one day. Maybe these other sites who – Kind of did it a sneakily weird, almost bad, you know, way, you know, end up <laughs> maybe somebody from the Wall Street Journal, or New York Times, ends up running one of those sites, and you know, they, and then they morph, you know, good Into journalism. Something more, yeah. With that, that yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just hoping that that we we get all this figured out because I, I just think it's. I don't know. I mean, it's just the right thing, you know, but I, I think overall, if you do, I, I would like to think if you do things the right way that it's the best, it ends up being the best way as well for everybody as far as the economy <laughs> and everything. I, I know that's stupid to say, I guess, no, but I'd I like know, to hope, yeah. you know, right, I'd, right, like, right. I'd like to hope there's at least a solution. So let's let's maybe move forward with that. So like you have paywalls, you know, micro payments, especially with this other thing with the Bitcoin and then some some other form yep, of micropayment yep. out there. I forget yep. what it's called. Uh, you have mobile apps, digital subscriptions. So first off, just please quickly describe what these are in case people aren't familiar with them, and and then move on to let me know if if you believe and you could talk about with them, you know, in unison or individually. But if they work and if they if these are potential solutions. So well, we got paywalls, um, micropayments, mobile apps, digital subscriptions, and then other forms of um, monetization that that can work for newsworthy sites. I think it depends. I think it depends on the site. I think it depends on the information that they're creating. Um, you know, for Spin Sucks specifically, we've created a sort of a professional development reputation, and so we can sell online courses. 
But I will tell you that in 2011, we had this big vision to launch a membership site that, you know, had courses, and this was before online courses were a thing, and, you know, you would join this membership site and pay $50 a month, and you would have access to all these experts and classes and all those kinds of things, and it flopped miserably. I mean, I we spent six figures, I'll tell you that, a lot of money um, to get this up and going, and nobody cared. So I think Nobody that wanted what, to pay, you mean? You weren't nobody getting your wanted subscriptions? To pay? No, nobody, nobody, like zero, zero dollars. So oh, man, that's been a bummer. We decided, yeah, it was bad. Last year we decided to just sort of dip our toe back into the water. I was a little reticent, of course, and we did a pilot of an online course and nailed it. We nailed it. Um, so I think that what's happening whoa, 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 is – Oh, back up, back up. Let's skip over from failure to success. <laughs> I mean, you just well, gave like a, a, a you just gave a, like an amazing example of, the, and then you're like, oh, no, no, no. I, I know it's about yourself, so maybe that's why you skipped over. So, well, what, what did what changed? Well, I, what, what, you know, what did I you do differently? This is, this is what I think. This is what major media sites are going through as well. Is they're testing certain things to see what happens to see what works and what doesn't, and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered was that yes, we have created a reputation as a professional development site, and when there's something very, 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 very specific that people have said they want, they are willing to pay for it. But it has to be at a certain level of professionalism. Like there's all these sort of things, right, that have to happen. Um, you have to have clout. You have to have trust. Yeah, you have to have trust. And you, you built that in the four years. In the four yep. years, you, yep. you've been, you speak a lot and you try. So all yep. of that obviously a played a books. part. Yep. You yep. wrote books. Yep. So you did all that yep. and you've done all this yep. free content. You've done all this stuff. So you did that. You built clout, built reputation, built trust. And, and the ad blocking one that you mentioned earlier, I did with Bo Sachs, that'll be coming out shortly. Before this one, um, that was his main thing. So you got to build that trust. You got So trust. you did yep. that. But then you also mentioned something in there about. People will pay for something specifically that they want. So, how did you find out what that was? I asked. <laughs> how, okay. So how did I you ask? And how did you? I literally sent a survey and I said, "If you could spend one hour with me, what would we talk about?" And I got, you know, smart-ass answers like, "Well, we would just have wine and cupcakes, which is fine, totally cool. I'm good with that." And I got things like, you know, an hour is not enough. Or, you know, I got kind of, I didn't get anything real from some people. And then some people really took it seriously and said things like, I'd love to figure out how you're all over the place from a content perspective. Or I'd love to have an hour of your time every month for a coaching, um, you know, to, to work directly with you. Or, you know, they gave those kinds of answers. And then we just waited. We waited those answers. We actually... This is a little-known trick, but we asked – so I asked, if you could spend an hour with me, what would we talk about? And it was two questions. And the second question was, if I need more information, may I call you? And the reason you do that is not because you're going to call all these people. It's because if people are willing to leave their phone number, they're more invested in the answer that they gave you, and they'd mm -hmm. like to talk to you about it. So if he, mm -hmm. some people said no thanks or, you know, not necessary or – not, you know, you know, things like that, or you already have my number, except that it was an anonymous survey and I didn't know who had said it, right? So, but yeah. if people left their number, then I weighted that higher than those that didn't. And then we took, so then we sort of mathematically took the top 20% responses and we, we went through with those and we looked to see of those 20%, where were we? And we ended up with three different buckets. And so we created a course last year, um, that's relaunching later this year on how to use media relations and content to increase your search results, um, increase your gener generate in, uh, qualified leads, and convert sales. So that's an online. So basically, course. what you just mentioned on that course is basically how you combine PR with content marketing. Yep. Is that? Yep. Can Can I have? That's can exactly I, it. Can I, can I have an hour of your time on that one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. I just got that asked that question to me on, in a in a sales meeting the other day, and I unfortunately oh, was really? like, no, I, yes, and I had to say, no, I haven't worked with a PR firm with uh, my staff's probably listening to this right now, and they're like shaking their head probably because <laughs> so I had to be honest, and the answer was no, I have not, um, and logically, it seems like I could figure it out a little bit, you know, but 
I bet no, the answer is no. So on the side, yeah, when is that course? <laughs> Just uh, say we're, launching no. we're launching September 20th. I'll let you know. Okay, please do. Uh, make, can you make a note to ding me about that? Yes, I will. Because I will. Um, that's funny. I mean, that, that, that just happened four days ago to me. And, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. It's funny how this happened, how, 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 all the, how, how life works, right? Things happen. Yeah, it is you, funny how life works. Uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's I awesome. Think that's the, I think that's the difference is, you know, and, and to go back to the very, very beginning when we were talking about the New York Times, and perhaps they do know their audience so well that, you know, this kind of thing works out from, you know, them mixing opinion with facts. Maybe it, maybe it works for them because they know their audience so well. But, you know, as a New York Times subscriber, I've never received an email, a survey asking me what I want. I've never re received any sort of survey asking what I would pay for. Um, and I think that's part of the issue is, you know, the, the lack of trust because now it's not, you see it as a non-fair fair and balanced publication. And then, you know, to go to both thing, which I hope people will listen to before they listen to this. And then it, so it goes to that, and it also goes to they're just sort of, from my perspective as a subscriber, just sitting in a conference room saying, well, let's try this, and not really mm -hmm. asking what the readers would pay for it. Yeah, I, I want to just emphasize, you know, kind of harp and, or emphasize this a little bit because, you know, we're talking, there's a problem, you know, and it almost felt like we weren't even going to get to any real solution just because it seems like the problem was was bigger than any any solution could could solve but to take this into you know obviously a lot of marketers and business people will, will be listening to this and to to put this in in you know real life everyday media outlets be it if you're a publishing site or, or you know uh media site or or whatever you know a training course or whatever is basically you got to build that trust. You know, you can't. This isn't going to work for somebody who says, "Great idea! I'm going to start this tomorrow. I'll send an email out to right. a list of a hundred thousand people <laughs> that I just bought this list from." And then, no. yeah, that's not going to work. But no. you know, over time, you know, from doing content marketing and blogs and podcasts, and if you have the chops for it, you know, write a book, do speak engagements, you know, or if you're just a, you know, a, a good old fashioned, you know, publisher, you know, whatever your niche is, you know, continuously, you know, be an expert on whatever you're writing about. So over time, you're going to build the trust. So I know that's a little bit of a, a fast, like assumption being made, but you know, nothing's really that easy. So, so that happens and, and you build it. This is a huge key point. You, you can now, and even New York times, you know, wall street journal, you know, what would you pay for? You know, what would be worth $29 a year or 59 or $99 a year? What is that? And then that, that right there is a business model to, to figure out, you know, and you don't need, you know, I mean, you, I mean, you can do the math real quick. You get thousand subscribers, you know, paying you a hundred dollars right, a year, right, you know, right. you're, you're, you're in business, right? Right. So, um, yeah. I, I think I think that is a potential solution for some of this. So for some of these outlets that want to hold integrity, and you know, and hey, if they need to downsize a tad, you know, but now they know that they can trust the money that's coming in because they have this passionate fan base that is paying them for what they want to hear. And all you need, all you did was, well, all you did. Again, I fast forwarded through the four, five, six, seven, eight years that you've been putting in the sweat, you know, the elbow grease to to get to the to the point where people will pay you for something but then you just asked and and that right. and that worked gargantuanly different than four years ago huh right right that's awesome uh but how i'm curious how would you answer that so if the new york times were to survey you and ask you what you would pay for what would you say well i you know if you're asking me particular people ask me this stuff and i i really only read a certain i you know i i do a lot of reading but it's only on a, in a couple areas. Um, one, you know, one's personal and one is business. Personal, mm -hmm. I just like to read about spiritual stuff, right? Not not necessarily okay. religious at all, but just you know, I've, those are the books that I read on for sure. that are that aren't like that. But then on the business side, I, I yeah, I just read a bunch as much as marketing stuff constantly. And normally it's um, from people like you and you know, Social Media Examiner, you know, Joe Polizzi's, Marcus Sheridan, Andrew Davis's of the world, all that stuff. You know, I just follow them, marketing profs. I get a ton of great information from. Um, so that stuff I read. So if they were to ask me something like that. 
Yeah. I mean, well, seeing that this happened five days ago, I think you answered my question because I want to learn about that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would probably say I would um, – I, if I could get, you know, one particular question answered a month, I'd pay $49 a month for that, you know, my personal question. If I had a personal so question could, that I wanted right. – if I could get my personal question answered. Now, is that realistic? I don't know. You know, but if somebody if somebody out there could do it, um, you know, that would be worth or it. What if, what if they came out and they said, I mean, and the New York Times isn't going to do this, but let's just go on that that example. What if they came out and they said, wow, uh, you know, of all of our readers, marketing people tend to make up 40%. So that that's a pretty significant number for us. What if we went to the top marketers and, you know, it could be the people you just listed. It could be Joe, it could be Ann, it could be Marcus, it could be Andrew, it could, you know, it could be Andy Christina, whoever happens to be, and say to them, you know, we'll pay you guys a stipend every month to create exclusive content for us that doesn't run anywhere else. You can't get it on Stinsox, you can't get it in Marketing Props, you mm -hmm. can't get it on the Sales Lion. And mm -hmm. it's only going to be on the New York Times, and, I, and they charge for that? You'd be interested in that, right? I'd 100% pay for that. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, we all, so we, we, just we solved, you know, we one just of our speakers. Is, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, we, we do that right now with the guy named John Loomer with Facebook advertising because he's just the best. And so we, we subscribe to his stuff, you know, and that's his business model. But yeah, I would say if a big site, you know, used that business model, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think people, I mean, 100% people would pay. I'd pay for it 100%. Yeah, especially if they, um, based it on, you know, or maybe like if once a year I got my question answered, right, you know, or right. something. And, and you know how many, you know, you really think my question is going to be unique? No. You no, know, for it'll, you know, right. from right. 10,000 people, it'll, there'll probably be, you know, a thousand or had the same exact question, you know. So, it, you know, the business model could work because you're not going to really answer 10,000 questions. You'd probably answer 800, you know. Right, but, right. Yeah, so, no, ab absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's, that 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 that's a potential solution. So, so I guess who 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 can we trust moving forward, Jeannie? Is there anyone we can trust <laughs> in this digital age? You know, I I think it's it, it's up. To, I, again, it's an it's an it depends. You know, I don't I don't necessarily know that the big guys are who we can trust. I think you I think you said it earlier, which was you have to go to two or three different sites to confirm stuff. You know, Snopes is my friend because. Anytime something publishes that I go, wait a second, that can't be real. You know, you have you have to check it out mm -hmm. um, because it's it's you know, and people doctor photos and, and share them, and you know, all those kinds of things are happening right now. So I think it's up to us as individuals to be as educated as we can to try to to listen to both sides. To you know, before we're sharing information, make sure it's right, it's correct, that it's not you know. The, I don't know if you saw this over the weekend, but one of the media sites, I can't remember who it was, um, took the picture. Do you remember a couple, about a year ago when the um, picture of Steven Spielberg in front of one of the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park went viral because everyone was like, I can't believe he's shot that and he's using that as a trophy. And, and people were like, that's a freaking dinosaur. <laughs> no, I don't. That's hilarious. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, everybody, like a year ago, everybody's all up in arms because Steven Spielberg has shot, hunted and shot this ginormous animal, and he's holding up it as a trophy, and, and I was like, it's a dinosaur. That yeah. is unbelievable. No. So I knew about the media the lion, sites, but I didn't know about that one. Right. I think it was around that same time that he did yeah. it, just sort of as a parody to show that yeah. you, know, you have to use your brain. So oh, one of the sure. media sites took that photo, like, in the last week and went out on the street and asked people what they thought, and it's the same thing. I can't believe he would do that. What kind of person shoots an animal like that? No, like, hardly anybody said it was a dinosaur. It's a that's dinosaur. Use your that's critical thinking skills. And I think that's what we're missing is people are, are not using critical thinking skills. They see something, we have an attention spans of naps, and we are incredulous, and so we share it, and then we've perpetuated it. Okay. So where, where do you see the future? Okay, where, where do you see the future of journalism going, and how would journalist jobs roles change? Uh, you know, you said it earlier, and it may be that you know I know BuzzFeed is trying really hard to become more um, trusted and actually fact-based and and deliver the news, but of course they have this reputation of 
being both feet. Um, so maybe it is. It is something like that. I also saw that one of the editors, I want to say from the Wall Street Journal, but don't quote me on that. It was one of the big publications, and it was the managing editor who's gone out on her own to start something new. So I think it is going to be people, journalists who see what's wrong with the world and have an idea on how to monetize it, and they're the ones, you know, we're going to see stuff popping up that probably will be more trusted than what I'll call the traditional media. Yeah, well, let's just hope there's, you know, the Richard Bransons of the world in the media industry, right? People who want to do right. it right but are right. smart and understand yep. that you need to mix I don't want to use the word sensationalism with it, but excitement, I guess. Or just yeah, knowing how to make money. Play to, yeah. yeah, know how to make money, but do it with, you know, Gaia capitalism in mind. So maybe Gaia journalism. Why don't you why don't you write a blog post about that? Just give me credit for it. Start okay, something sure. called Ga- Gaia journalism, <laughs> you know. And and let's let's see if we can create a movement for let people make because I mean you can't tell people to eat peanuts, but at least you were honest, right? I mean you right. gotta you gotta be able to make you know you know pay your bills and you know live a nice right. life. Right. Um, so it's just you know oh well, yeah maybe that's the answer maybe that's the answer and and I I will see say this from my experience I I do see a growing demand for um, high-quality uh, journalism and writers. I, I thought I maybe five-ish years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, um, journalism, journalism, they, journalists couldn't make a buck, right? I mean, they just right. – they were so devalued because of, I guess, I guess the, the, the breaking point in a good way was all the um, – updates, the Panda Penguin updates on Google and stuff that started to right. do away with all the just write, baby, just write, right, just write and <laughs> stuff and go, 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 go. It doesn't matter, and it didn't matter. But um, seeing when that changed, and, and especially as things have gotten more crowded, um, the quality uh, of what you're reading and write, I guess, you know, from them what they're writing, but what people – it's become so important. So I do see, you know, for, you know, that's a pretty very nice career you can go into now. If, if, you're, if you're good, you know, you're going to – you know, this isn't for – you know, I'm not saying that you're going to be 10, 000, you know, hundreds and thousands of new jobs for journalists. No, it's going to be good ones, you know, but right, there is right. a career there. So I guess – how do you see their job changing, though? If somebody was wanting to go into journalism, where would you say, like, you know, we've kind of touched on it, um, and I kind of have my own opinion, and I'll throw in my my opinion uh, after yours, but how, how do you see the, the journalist job roles and I guess their skill sets maybe changing? Or what do you need in this new age that we live in? Well, I think it's, it is changing and evolving because now – journalists are paid based on page views. So they have to be good at social media. They have to be decent at search engine and optimization. They have to, you know, they have to understand how all of those pieces work, just like a content marketer has to understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, until, until the big boys in the, you know, conference rooms figure out how to monetize this stuff and they're paying people based on how many page views they get, you know, human nature is to say, well, if I'm going to be paid on page views, then I'm probably going to do something a little sensationalism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, but I think you nailed it. I think I think journalists need to be superior writers. And yep. then on top of that, they at least need to know the basics of all the other stuff. You know, they need to yeah, know I, how I to think so. tag everything right and do all that good stuff and, you know, and possibly even getting into the social part of it all as far as the strategy around all of that. But, you mm-hmm. know, that's not to say, you know, great piece of content, you know, and, and if it's spot on, will, you know, can get going too, you know. Right. Uh, maybe not right. as much as Cecil the Lion or Steven Spielberg, right. but, you know, <laughs> maybe, may, you know, maybe that's the thing. 
maybe it's these sites who mix in some of that stuff with people know it's not real, like a BuzzFeed could do this, you know, their business model. They could lead with some of that stuff to get people on the page, but that's just like, ah, we're just joking around, that's fun, but hey, here's some good shit, right? And maybe, maybe, that's, the, maybe that's the way, you know? And well, so, and, you know, I mean, we do um, Gin and Topics every Friday, which is just the five funniest videos that we found during the week. It has nothing to do with PR. It has nothing to do with marketing. It's just five funny videos that we give you every, you know, once a week. And mm-hmm. so you can do that kind of stuff to bring people in and then have mm-hmm. the more serious stuff, you know, the rest of the time. Jeannie, it sounds like you're doing it. Maybe, maybe <laughs> I'm going to nominate you as my guy <laughs> journalist, journalism ambassador because I think <laughs> you, what you, the two things that you, we've talked about that other companies can do, you're doing right now. And you're seeing them work, right? We are seeing them work. I mean, we're definitely tested. But at the same time, we're not a journalism site. We're not, you know, we're not the New York Times that's supposed to be out there telling the world all the good things that are happening. That's not us by by far. I mean, we're definitely a professional service or professional development site. Yeah. Yeah, but you have an audience. But you have an audience. We do. So so there's some similarities. Um, All right. Well, just any parting thoughts, anything anybody can do to – Kind of, you know, if they're like, yeah, this needs to change. Anything anybody can do to to help? Any any, any party thoughts? Any anything to leave us with? I think it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of you know being diligent about making sure that the stuff that you're sharing is is true and it's accurate, and that you're not sharing a viral photo of Steven Spielberg who killed an animal. You know, I think those are the kinds of things that we have to be really diligent about. All right. I think that's a good pointer. Everyone, you know, can can help out with our with our new movement, Jeannie. It's our new movement. So, <laughs> how can people continue to learn from you? Uh, spinsucks.com. Spinsucks.com. That's a, that's it. And, and what's your Twitter handle? Uh, my name, Jenny Dietrich. That's G I N I D I E T R I C H. All Look right, Jeannie. Thank you. That's awesome. I was reading it. It's right in front of me. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, hey, thanks so much. Always fun. And, and this was very interesting to dig into. And, you know, hopefully maybe maybe we get to one person who, you know, that's been sitting on an idea that they run with. Or maybe we inspire a Wall Street Journal, you know, person to go and, you know, do something similar with that other lady's doing you mentioned of breaking yeah, out and doing, and doing something. Yep. You never yep. know. You never know. Well, you thanks so know. much, Janine. Till next time. Thanks for having me. All righty. Bye-bye.